Hey everyone, Mr. Technodad here. My house has a bit of a problem with the house flies. They have tiny conventions outside the front door, and then they sneak in when we go in or out. I've tried various things to get rid of them. Exterminators, traps, bug zappers, whatever. One thing that worked pretty well was my oldest son would get annoyed at the bugs, grab a fly swatter, and mow down wave after wave of those little germ delivery vehicles like it was a bedwars tournament. It's super effective, but I can't do that anymore because, you know. Bro melts is up for contact constantly! I was left without a good solution until one day I was out for a drive with my wife and we passed a store with the greatest sign I have ever seen. Carnivorous plants! But which one to get? Now, I will admit that the Venus flytrap has the coolest look. But I wanted something that not only looks really good, but is also effective at what it does. Like my wife. Aww. <laughs> I decided to get two Drosera. You mean I decided to get two Drosera. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Marriage is a partnership. Drosera have what look like dew drops all over them, even in the full sun, which is how they get their common name of sundew. The drops are actually a mucilaginous adhesive. And if you ever brush up against one, which you should try to avoid, you'll notice that they always feel wet because their leaves are mucilaginous. And look, they grow these long stalks with teeny tiny little flowers at the top. They grow them so long so that they won't eat the bugs trying to pollinate them. Drosera are the first species of plant that was confirmed to be carnivorous in a book published in 1875 by none other than Charles Darwin. Now, I've had carnivorous plants before. I mean, who hasn't? You're my Morticia. Aww. But because of my level of gardening ability, there's one thing that past carnivorous plants have done for me pretty consistently and that is die. So I thought I'd try to understand them in the hopes of being able to better keep them alive. What makes an innocent plant turn carnivorous? Wanting a high protein diet to compensate for always skipping leg day? Growing on cursed soil from a haunted battlefield? Or are some plants simply born bad with a garden variety thirst for blood? We may never know the truth. However, we do know that carnivorous plants mostly come from swamps, where they are used to two things, lots of sunlight and soil that's low in nutrients. To supply enough light, you can just buy a grow lamp. That's what we did. The lack of nutrients was the evolutionary pressure that caused them to adapt to eating bugs. In fact, they are so adapted to a lack of nutrients in the soil that the minerals in ordinary tap water will overwhelm them to the point where they die so you have to water them with distilled water. You might be able to get that at your grocery store or your hardware store, or you can buy a home distiller. That's the formula that worked for me. One, a grow light, and two, distilled water. In fact, the soil in these drosera here serve little purpose. It merely provides a bit of structure and modesty to the plant's lower half. Like a bikini bottom. Exactly, like that place where SpongeBob lives. <laughs> Besides water, these plants still need other nutrients, which brings us to the Feed Me Seymour section of the video. We mentioned that these plants have mucilaginous leaves. Specifically, the leaves have a gazillion tiny tentacles on them, and each tentacle ends in a little droplet of mucilage. When the fly lands on the leaf, they get stuck in the mucilage. The plant can actually recognize the struggle of the fly, and the tentacles will bend towards the fly to get him more stuck and sometimes the leaf even rolls up on him. The mucilage also contains digestive enzymes, as if that's not horrifying enough. The plant can slurp up the nitrogen and the other yummy things from the delicious fly. But it leaves a gross exoskeleton. Yeah. That's how these plants get the... <laughs> cracking me up, yeah. I'm sorry. That's how these plants get the nutrients they need. Nutrients that are not present in the swampy soil they are adapted to. Now, all this raises an interesting question. <laughs> Come on. It, it is an interesting question, though. My whole life, I've heard about 
how plants take up nutrients from the soil through their roots. I bet you studied plants in grade school. Do you remember learning about the importance of the xylem and the phloem? Me neither. Because of this narrative, I've always imagined that plants are converting water and soil into more plant. I thought that's what plants were made of, water and soil. It makes sense. I'm sure you've heard the term carbon-based life forms. We all have a lot of carbon in us, and the soil is the second largest repository of carbon after the oceans. But no, carnivorous <laughs> plants' inability to take nutrients from the soil shows that they aren't made from soil and water. And it turns out, non-carnivorous plants... Uh, Stacy, if a plant isn't carnivorous, what do you call it? Vegan. Yeah, vegan. Vegan plants aren't made out of soil either. So where does all that carbon come from? What are plants made out of? Okay, I'm gonna get all sciencey on you for a hot <laughs> minute, but I promise there is a payoff. What are plants actually made out of? Dun, 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 Like pretty much all living things, plants are mostly water. But no plant is made completely out of water, except ice plant. So what else are they made out of? After water, the rest of the plant is almost entirely carbohydrates. What are carbohydrates? The answer is right there in the name. Carbo means carbon, and hydrates, like in the word hydration, means water. Carbohydrates are biomolecules made out of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. For example, cellulose, starch, and glucose. There are a lot of other things besides water and carbohydrates, but they make up a fairly small portion of the plant. When we put all the numbers together, Plants are roughly 65% oxygen, 20% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 2% nitrogen, and 2% everything else. Potassium, calcium, phosphorus, lots of other elements. In other words, more than 95% of the plant comes from just oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen in the form of water and carbohydrates. When you trace those carbohydrates back, they're all synthesized from glucose. So where does that glucose come from? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. <laughs> exactly. Let's just briefly touch on photosynthesis. Stay with me here. As we all know, photosynthesis is the process that plants go through to convert water and CO2 into glucose. Six CO2 plus six H2O plus sunlight makes one molecule of glucose and six molecules of atmospheric oxygen, aka O2. It all starts with glucose. Glucose is used to make plant structures and it's also the energy source for mitochondria. And mitochondria are the, well, you know. Let's look at that equation again. Six CO2. There, that is where the plant gets its carbon from. And that CO2 comes from the atmosphere. What are plants made out of? Almost entirely, plants are made out of two things, water and air. Plants are made out of air. In the twilight's whisper, Jahilda, me know, the sundew's leaves glisten, each one mucilaginous. Beneath the moon's glow sings an old impresario, with sunlight now gone, there's no more photosynthesis. Stars hum a silent tune, mmm, I'm yet. The heart's quiet croon brings forth deep melancholia. The xylem, the phloem, the dreams we beget. The cell's powerhouse, as we know, are mitochondria. Thank you for listening. Uh, I think we're good.